Hey guys, Girl from Saving Throw Show here. Today I'm going to be interviewing Mike Selinker and Rodney Thompson, two of the developers behind Thornwatch, which is a card game slash board game slash RPG hybrid um, made by Lone Shark Games in conjunction with the guys from Penny Arcade. So let's go ahead and give them a call. So uh, to get started, let's uh, hear about you guys. Tell me who you are and tell me uh, a little bit about your past. You go first. Okay. Uh, well, I'm Rodney Thompson, and I am a game designer. I've been designing games professionally for about 15 years now. Uh, I started out doing design for the uh, Wizards of the Coast Star Wars role-playing game, oh. and uh, then became a freelancer and did freelance for a bunch of D&D stuff for Wizards and other third-party companies. And, and then eventually, in 2007, I got hired by Wizards of the Coast to work for them full-time, running the Star Wars RPG, the Saga Edition product line. And so I did that for about five years. A uh, little, little under five years. Then I moved over onto D and D, uh, where I worked on D and D Fourth Edition supplements. Uh, I, I've done some board game design. I designed, uh, or I, I helped uh, co-design uh, Lords of Waterdeep and Dungeon Command and Tyrants of the Underdark. Uh, and then I was uh, on the design team for D and D Fifth Edition as well. Oh, awesome. And yeah, and then about a year and a half ago, I left Wizards, and now I work at Bungie on the Destiny video game franchise, and uh, get to work on cool products, projects like Thornwatch uh, with uh, Mike and the other Lone Sharks. That is truth. That is truth. <laughs> um, I'm Mike Selinker. I'm the president of Lone Shark Games. Uh, I am also a game designer, uh, at least every now and then. Uh, I make uh, a couple of things. I was the, I was also at Wizards, although Rodney and I were not there at the same time. Um, oh, ships passing in the night. Well, he's 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 a lot younger than I am. He's, <laughs> he's a he's a plucky young lad, whereas I am I am of the old guard, uh, the the wizened the wizened elders of the wood. Uh, so um, so I was uh, I was there uh, on third edition Dungeons and Dragons. I was one of the creative directors on that. Uh, I also did a bunch of trading card game stuff. I was a creative director on our Harry Potter lines and our Marvel lines and all sorts of other things like that. I did. Uh, um, Made a few games while I was there. I uh, developed the game Betrayal at House on the Hill and uh, um, did a game called Risk Godstorm and a few others, uh, rebooted Axis and Allies. And then eventually I decided to leave Wizards and go over to my own company, which I founded with James Ernest, called Lone Shark Games, which is a happy little studio of uh, game designers and event designers over, at, over in uh, Redmond, Washington. We have um, a bunch of people that get to work with us in addition to Rodney. We have Paul Peterson, who is the designer of Smash Up and Guillotine. Um, we have uh, my development team, uh, Chad Brown and Gabby Weidling and Liz Spain and Elisa Teague and Keith Richmond. Um, just, a, just a really good group of people. And we also just by random chance happen to be in the Penny Arcade building. Oh. Where they're downstairs, neighbors. so, so we've been working on some of our own games. Um, we've made, uh, in addition to the Pathfinder Adventure card game and uh, Lords of Vegas. I almost said Lords of Waterdeep. <laughs> no, that was me. Oh, no, wait, that was you. <laughs> you know, alphabetically, I precede you. It is true. <laughs> you have to get through Lords of Vegas to get to Lords of Waterdeep. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, so uh, Lords of Vegas. Uh, we did. Um, we've done a bunch of other games, unspeakable words, things like that. But now we're starting to produce our own stuff. We've got a game called The Ninth World that Paul and Bo and I uh, put together, and we've got uh, another game, which is our follow-up game to the Pathfinder Adventure card game called Apocrypha, which is getting real close to done. Mm. And then we thought that was going to be pretty much enough, and then, uh, well, some fortunes changed. <laughs> um, so, so we'll get into, I guess, what those fortunes are. Yeah. Um. Actually, looking over your website, I, there's a bunch of things you guys do that I had no idea. And uh, like Gen Con, you guys do the puzzle hunt for Gen Con. Yeah, we do a lot of puzzle stuff. We, yeah. uh, I, I, we, we love that. Uh, our Gen Con puzzle hunt's one of our favorite things we do every year. We also do uh, a lot of puzzle events at the Paxes, and mm -hmm. uh, we do all of like we've done some big, big things for. Uh, Bioware's games, 
Um, we've done uh, we've done uh, some stuff for Bethesda. So we do a lot of a lot of puzzle and, and event stuff as well. And I, I wrote also wrote a couple of puzzle books. I wrote a, a game a book called The Maze of Games, which is a um, a puzzle novel, and uh, then a. Uh, another book on puzzle craft called or called puzzle craft which is about making puzzles so we have a nice wide group of things that we do um and it allows us to do something that i don't think anybody else gets to do which is i get to work with all my friends and so when yeah. rodney when rodney um uh made himself available uh, <laughs> when he when he when he when he headed out, headed out on the open road with just a bindle bindle on his back and uh, yeah. singing waltzing, with, that's not what happened. Not not exactly. No. <laughs> well, I was I was happy to be one of the first people who knew about it. How about that? So yeah, that, that's true. So, that works. So yeah. So you mentioned that you guys work in the same building as Penny Arcade. Is that how that collaboration started? Did they literally just walk into your suite and said, "Hey, would you guys like to make a game with us?" That's exactly how it happened. They really? had no idea who we were. They were like, what are you doing? You no. Know, uh, uh, I actually met the guys in 2004. Um, they had, I didn't know about their comic strip much, but um, they had. They, I, I, they did something online, and uh, I, I thought it was interesting, and then I realized they had a convention, their first ever convention, what was called PAX. Right. Uh, there wasn't a PAX West or a PAX east or anything like that in anybody's mind and i just walked in for like about an hour right i was only there for and i said i like this crowd this is my kind of people they're laying around on bean bags playing nintendo games that's cool <laughs> and uh so i just got to know them and we've done stuff together on a on a smaller scale uh just from the beginning i have been to literally every pax wow uh sorry no, that's not true i lied i've been to every okay. pax in the united states I haven't okay, been to the that's what I was going to say. Like Australia, wow. I, 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 I cut my streak at that point because I yeah. realized that that required me to go to Australia every yeah. year. And I yeah. was like, I can't, I can't promise that's going to occur. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, but I've been to all the PAXs. We've done at least one thing, one event or one major launch or something at every one of those PAXs since that point. And so, um, yeah, I, uh, We'd become very good friends, and then at one point, Mike Krahulik uh, just sort of let slip that he was working on a, a game of his own. And, um, well, I told him he had to show it to me. <laughs> and I didn't want to do that. And, uh, and I said, okay, I'll see you on Friday when you show me this game. <laughs> and uh, so he, he worked, he, he polished it up and showed it to me. And I was like, yeah, I really like this. I think this is an awesome thing. So it took some took some time to get around to the point where we were helping them on it. We, we wanted yeah. to just see them do it on their own. That was when it was called uh, Card Warriors, right? I never saw it. No, I never saw it. No, I don't actually know that anybody ever saw Card Warriors. <laughs> so Card Warriors was what... Uh, Mike called it. Well, importantly, it is always Card Warriors with a Z. With a Z, yeah. Because <laughs> that is that's how you know the mark of quality is upon it. It's very important, yeah. Uh, so, uh, but uh, I don't think anyone ever actually played Card Warriors. Yeah. I think like Jamie and and like you can see in his notebooks that he'd write like this is Jamie's character, right? And I sense yeah. that Jamie was there when that character was made. <laughs> But I can't prove to you that they actually ever right. played a version of that game. Yeah. Um, I saw for the figured, Kickstarter you guys are doing it. He's going to release the notes for that game, too. We, as part of yeah, the we game. just posted it, actually, and it's okay. amazing. So Rodney and I are not this brave. <laughs> no. No. There's, there's never any point you will see one of my development notebooks online. <laughs> there's never going to happen, right? Yeah. Uh, but... Um, uh, I hope he's not watching because I'm about to say this. But of course, we convinced him that that's what all developers do. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, you got like, oh sure. I mean, uh, when uh, it, right, we, we originally had a game. It was called Lords of Some Gambling Town, 
Like, we didn't even know <laughs> it was going to be Las Vegas at gotcha. that point. We put up the note. No, we completely lied to him about it. And so, um, but no, he was actually incredibly generous uh, because he does everything in public. And he's he, he once said, this is an amazing sentence. He once said, uh, for me, nothing is real till other people see it. Yeah, yeah. And wow. that's the exact opposite of me. Like, I'm... I'm like, I can't show you this yet. <laughs> I just can't until yeah. it's, it's percolated out of my head. So, I don't know, Rodney, are you more willing to share than that, or are you? Uh, I don't know. Like, there things are in usually such rough shape early on that there's usually, I mean, you might not even be able to tell what it is if we were to show it to anybody else. And so, I mean, like we kept a lot of the original uh, materials for Lords of Waterdeep and then went back and looked at it like, you know, two years later. And it's like, well, what even is this? I <laughs> can't even tell. So, you know, my stuff tends to be more kindergarten crafts and uh, hastily <laughs> scrawled notes than anything else. So it's not exactly coherent. Uh, there's also a lot of like the rule book doesn't exist uh, except as like words that we say out loud sometimes. So sure. that yeah. happens from time to time. Yeah, yeah. I think um, there's a there's a prototype of the Pathfinder Adventure card game, which was the one that we took to. Um, to Paizo, the first PaizoCon, which is, which looks shockingly good. I mean, it's all typed out, right? And and you could you can see what the game will become. And there's, but there's a previous iteration of that called Saints, that really does like it's playable, but it is like terrifying to <laughs> us that it would ever get out, right? But no, Mike Mike uh, Mike has from the beginning been committed to to a process that interacts with his fans and it's incredibly courageous uh to me but um but yeah so we i mean rodney i i saw it before rodney did i saw it um maybe maybe a year before rodney did i guess mm -hmm. I and think. worked on it. and then so and and i would just you know, we're working on games all day, right? So so it's not a big, strange thing for me to walk upstairs when they say, guys, we're having trouble with the the um, combat mechanic here. Can you come upstairs? I'm like, sure, right. I can come upstairs. You got free soda. And so <laughs> I'd go up there and I'd just sort of push the game subtly to places that, that I think it could go. But when they asked us... They sort of hit the point of like we're not game designers and we're not a game publishing company and there's so much more that you guys know than we do on this subject. Um, I was like, okay, yeah. I mean, obviously we want this game to come out and we we will benefit if we're involved. Uh, and I've got a bunch of ideas, but if I'm going to do that, I'm going to bring some some real smart people to the table because because we're dealing with real smart people. Right. right. I mean, Mike and Jerry and Mike Failauer and uh, Kiko and and just the the crew upstairs is full of geniuses. Yeah. And so we had to match that with our own skill set, and uh, so that's how Chad got onto the project. That's how Rodney got on. That's how. No <laughs> smart, smart people, <laughs> all smart. So Rodney, when did uh, when did you get involved in that process? He said about a year into after he had seen it. So yeah. what, what was your first experience seeing the game and meeting Mike and Jerry? What was that like? Yeah, uh, it, it, it was about a year ago. Uh, and I had met Mike and Jerry just sort of casually a few times because I was running a D&D &D game that had... Uh, Selinker and Mike Failauer and a few other people in it, and so I would see them around the the Penny Arcade Loan Shark offices. So we met a few times, and um, when uh, when um, I told Mike I was ready to start working on other projects, uh, he you know basically called together a meeting of uh, meeting of the mics, as I call it. Yeah. It was basically Selinker and then Mike Failauer and then Mike Krahulik ran the game for us so I could see what it was like. And, uh, you know, we, we played that first session. I was like, oh, okay, like this is a, it's a premature concept. Like obviously 
uh, Mike Rahulik has like a vision for what he wants the game to be about. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just at this point we need to take that vision and, and bring it home, right? And so, like the version that I played, a lot of those mechanics, you know, uh, still survive to this day in in the in the design, right? So, for me, coming in, a lot of it was just about okay, like. Uh, they've they've got the plane up in the air. I just want to bring it in for a landing. And so a lot of what I've tried to do over the last year is just sort of look at what the goals were that he had for the game, right? I want it to be a tactical game that plays in this amount of time, that tells a really good story, et cetera, and then figure out the best way to do all those things. So uh, it's been actually, it's been a pleasure, but it's been, uh, you know, like a nice guided process where like I came in and there were very clear goals laid out and we just sort of had to, continue to evolve the game and it, it will continue to evolve you know even over the next few months so mm-hmm. uh you know it's it's been it's been interesting not like there have been other games that i've worked on that i i didn't come in at the very beginning that i i've come in part way through but this has been one that like it really was a well-established game by the time i started you know uh assisting with the design it's interesting i hadn't really drawn a connection my first project after i left lone shark was pirates of the spanish main Oh, and sure. and uh, James had a core design that he had worked out with uh, Jordan Weissman and Ethan Pasternak over at uh, WizKids. And I just sort of came in and was like, okay, so it sounds like you need a game designer help you out here. And I wrote all the ships and I wrote all the, like, I wrote, you know, the first drafts of how certain things worked in the game. But But it actually was a really good first project for me. Right after, you know, being being creative director at Wizards and having to think of all the things and and you know, figure out what direction was right. Um, instead, I could just come in and say, I'm going to be a steady hand here and make this the best thing I could do. And and um, it really gave me confidence uh, in the stuff that I would produce after I left Wizards. So I'm glad that that. Um, Rodney was available because I knew he had all that technical expertise that he'd done with Dungeon Command and and the other games over there, and obviously, uh, but I mean, as far as I knew, his, you know, his his experience on working on RPGs was here is this giant brand that already has all of the things decided for it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, you are not going to invent Star Wars today. Yeah. <laughs> right. You, know, no. you are lucky if you get a different model on your gonk droid. Yeah. Yes. Uh, right. Um, approved. So, uh, whereas this was a different situation. This was a game that that really didn't have. It had it had its concepts worked out, but it really didn't have its roots in place. It was like everything felt very fluid. Like we knew what we wanted to happen but not and and maybe why we wanted it to happen but not how best to accomplish it and that really required rodney and chad to come in and just anchor the thing in a way that i don't think i could have done uh just by helping mike and jerry out if it had just been sort of me coming in and assisting them yeah right yeah it's been so much more of a collaborative process now the other side of that is they have shown us things about how to make make our games that we never saw before. Um, we've never had an interactive process with somebody who has so much graphic and art knowledge uh, that isn't an employee. It was at, at Lone Shark, right? Um, right? That that could be there at the beginning and say, you know, here I'm going to help you solve problems that you don't know exist uh and you know i've got i'm very lucky i have liz spain and elisa teague on my design staff and both of them are fashion designers they're they're graphic designers they know visual uh symbology and information flow and stuff like that um and i think both of them would say that mike Rahulik is in uh, is on another planet from that from them right yeah. because i mean he knocks out three comic strips a week <laughs> yeah he he designs all of the penny arcade pins and all of the the 
iconography and, and stuff like that. He and, and, and he's ably assisted by, by our friend Kiko, who has also done a, a brilliant job on this game, uh, making it look good. But I mean, he's, it's, it's just very, um, it's not just limited to how the game, how the pictures in the game look. We are designing a comic book that comes to life. Yeah, it's, a, it's very unique compared to any other board game I've ever seen. Like anything in this style has never been done as far as I've seen. So it's it's We're great. Not. I mean, when, uh, you know, you guys came up, Rodney and uh, Mike sort of together came up with um, how the how the map would look. Yeah. Well, why don't you talk about that? I was going to try to describe what you did. <laughs> why don't you describe what well, you did? So, so you know, like like I was saying earlier, it's been it's been a, a fun project to work on because I've gotten to come in and focus on like, okay, let's make this the best possible version of that thing that Mike wants to make, right? And so when I got in and I played for the first time, one of the things we noticed was that there was, you know, kind of a bit of a, a slowness around the table, right? And so like, okay, mm -hmm. we're focusing on like we're going to focus on uh, trying to to make sure that the downtime between your turns isn't quite so high, right? Uh, and when I looked at it, when that we played for that first time, I was noticing we were spending a lot of time counting out squares and like measuring distances and dealing with a lot of um, uh, very micro level movement stuff that in the end ended up just being like, okay, I just need to make sure I'm in position to do this thing, right? And so I came back the first time, I was like, okay, guys, I'd like to try an experiment to see if we can speed time up around the table by eliminating like square counting, for example. And I want to go with more of a zones based approach, like, mm -hmm. are you in the right zone, et cetera, all right? And so I laid out, and really, like, the first version of this was I literally printed out some uh, eight and a half by 11 pages. That cut them in half, and each of them had like, you know, the dark swamp and the canyon and things like that. And I laid them out in like a, I think it was like a four by five grid, right? And it was literally just like I laid out these zones. I was like, okay, and so here's like the primitive version of this. And you know, we played and kind of moved things around, and they saw like, okay, when we're more concerned about being in the right area, it does move a little faster. And then right. Grimulik went away, and he was like, okay, this is cool. Let's do the actual good version of this. And he went away and came back with this idea that, no, the the map isn't a grid. It's puzzle pieces, effectively, like these different pieces that fit together. Mm -hmm. And then we sat down, and he brought in um, uh, some, like, poster board that he had printed out or that he had uh, taped printouts to. So it was a little bit thicker. And he's like, and we could do this, this, and this. And we sat down there, and, like, someone picked it up and was like, and then we can just take these pieces and rearrange them into a totally different shape. And right. and something that was really great about having Mike's graphical knowledge and, and expertise on hand was that he looked at it and he saw that it wasn't just areas that we needed. What we needed was things that would inspire you to combine them in different ways, right? Like the 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 what we call sort of the default square layout does a really great job of highlighting a large image in the center, mm -hmm. but by going away from sort of same shaped pieces, like the half of a, a page of paper to the you know elbow pieces and the long narrow pieces and the square pieces we started to see like okay this will actually inspire us to create non-traditional map shapes and do things that are like okay this is like this scenario feels different because the map looks different even if the mechanics of moving from place to place and the mechanics of having rules on the terrain don't change like it just by the physical layout of the board, yeah. it's going to, to to feel totally different. And that was something that, like, I wasn't thinking about that. I was thinking about speed of play and how do we communicate this mm -hmm. to the players. And he was able to sort of take it from, like, my idea was, like, let's, let's assume that we think that my idea was good. My idea was like <laughs> a B. And then his input is what kicks it up to an A, right? right. Yeah. yeah. And I sort of came into that and went... No, uh, screw all that. Get out, get rid of all no, this. No. We're like, actually, no, Mike, no. Pretty sure, pretty sure that has actually literally never happened. Um, <laughs> but I have actually done something very similar to that, which is, screw all that, now you figure out what the problem is and solve it. <laughs> like, I have done that. I have, I have come in, throw, flip the table over, and said, make me something better, and walked out. Yeah. That is yeah. definitely it. But in that specific case, the one sort of impact I had on that process was to sort of look back at it as the guys were like hovered over the center of it. I was like, okay, what if these are really 
comic book panels. You know, like Mike is like, like I want it to feel like it's part of a, a illustrated world. I'm like, well, fine, but you guys make comic strips, you make comic books. Let's make one of those. And so, what does that? Dis and they were like, that sounds really good. What does that even mean? And then, and then we had yeah. to try to figure out what the answer to that was. Um, so, a really key example of that was how the the monster and character tokens looked. Mm. Um, they were predominantly circles um, viewed viewed and, and when they were on the hex it was not the hex map the the grid map you were looking down from space on top of them right and I, I sort of went what happens if we tilt this camera so that you're looking at it from the side you know you're getting a, a view of the the village and there's a house directly in front of you not from above, but from the um, from from the perspective of the player, or from the perspective of the character in the story, and then so that sort of led to what if the pawns were viewed in profile? Yeah, you know, so that like like an actual character would be on the edge of a panel, and then Mike brought in what if the actual panel borders, right? Yeah, stay, right, so that uh, you get a sense that there's a division between these things. That like it is like the characters would move from panel to panel, and then Rodney sort of looked at that and went, "Well, what if there was a monster and this became this four-headed snapping turtle thing? Yeah. And what if its ability was that it was so big it walked between the panels mm -hmm. and it broke the frame yeah. of the panel? And it's like, wow, that's very dramatic. Yeah, <laughs> it's like it's like one of those uh, uh, written, um, I guess they call them like letterers do sound effects." Yeah, that yeah. Break, break the wall of the panel, right? You know, and stuff like that. So, I mean, I, uh, oh, Rodney also added, um, uh, we had had a concept called the river, which were cards that uh, sat to the side and you would power them up over the course of the game or defeat them slowly over the course of the game. Rodney just picked those up, redrew them, and put them on the map as if they were, um, meanwhile, kind yes. of, you know, thing. And so... That's just that's a process that you just can't invent and walk yeah. into the room and say I made this game. Yeah. Everybody like you need really cool people trying to knock out the ideas together because no one of them is going to figure out all that by themselves. Yeah. And uh, it got it got pretty cool. It yeah. got pretty cool. It's a very unique thing. Uh, when I looked at the print and play this week for the first time, I was looking at the first scenario you guys did where it's the basic square map with the corners and the the village in the mm -hmm. middle, and I'm like. How does this turn into a different map? Won't, won't it be the same one? And then I saw uh, the other scenario where it's like uh, a village villager that's getting like hunted, where it's like a long segment. I'm like, oh, this makes yeah. perfect sense. Yeah, you could do anything with this now. And it's very yeah. unique how the, the the it looks like a comic book. It looks just like one. And like you were saying, that monster that breaks through uh, the tiles, it kind of reminds me of, do you guys ever play this very old school video game called Comic Zone? It's about this guy yeah. who became... Yeah, 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 it's on the Genesis. Yes, exactly, yeah. It's, it reminds me so much of that, and it's such a unique idea that, for some reason, nobody's used since then, but you guys... Well, are... you need you need Mike Krahulik. I mean, like, yeah. you can't just <laughs> say... Helps. Right, like, there's no chance that Rodney and I decide we're going to do a comic book game yeah. <laughs> and then we go find a comic book artist that can do the right. game that's in our head. Right. right. Like that, that doesn't produce a good result. Yeah. You need somebody who's lived that life. And Jerry Holkins, his, his right, his co-writer, um, mm -hmm. can sort of think in the small spaces that comic books allow you to write. I mean, we're, we're used to giant blocks of text and, and stuff like that. And, and yeah. he, you know, we just get a lot out of that. So, um, I think that, uh, that it's, it's the, it's the game that Lone Shark and Penny Arcade would logically make together. Yeah. And uh, which is, the which idea is, is doing so well. I mean, the Kickstarter only has about a week left, I think, but you guys have like crushed your goal by like four or five times already. And I mean, did you guys expect it to be so popular when you first started it, the Kickstarter? Um, I mean, I, I don't know what I expected. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> I certainly uh, hoped that the people that we had been teasing for, 
for two years, you yeah. know, with this would come out and after they, mm -hmm. you know, had read all those blogs and stuff like that, and they'd, they'd come out and say, yeah, that's, that's my kind of game. Yeah. I don't know. We did, a we did a thing we've never done before. We launched a Kickstarter on stage live, uh, with com well, completely kind of. flawlessly, completely flawlessly. Did oh. you? <laughs> <laughs> um, that, uh, yeah. So yeah. we, we launched it during the Twitch streaming of the, of the main, the opening panel at PAX and PAX West, right, yeah. so, PAX West. and mm -hmm. so we were pretty sure that was going to do pretty good. Yeah. Like yeah. we were like, we were like, we have about a billion people watching us right yeah. now. Like we're, we're going to, but <laughs> there was always the f fear that that was going to be it. Yeah. Like that we got all the people right there. Right. And um, so we felt like that group of people would probably pay for the game. Yeah. Uh, pay for the, the goal, but we didn't know beyond that. Like I think our our goal was let's my my goal is always put it put a goal out there that that if I I get really happy if I get five times that amount. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. Then I can. Then, well, I look at it that way because then I know that all the bills are paid. Right. Right. Like yeah. I like that's actually one of the things I think about. Right. Like what do I need to make the, make the game is one thing. And then what do I need to make sure that that everybody's comfortable during this process and and we don't have to rush our way through it and 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 uh, we can do the best game we possibly can and we can make it out of the best components we can stuff like that yeah. and the um the the main goal was was enough to get a game out for sure yeah um but uh, but I, I we get into the comfort zone the the really really uh, we can really make the game we want and take the time to do it right um, uh, when we get to about the stage that we are and, and I'm real happy with that we we've uh, we've had a very charmed life on Kickstarter yeah uh, being a fan of Penny Arcade for years and years I knew when he started talking about it a couple of years ago at PAX like I knew it was gonna be huge then like you could see how much passion he had for this game that was two years out three years out actually and he was yeah. just so into it, and it's it's so popular. I have you guys heard of Tabletop Simulator actually? Oh yeah, uh, we get someone, asked all the time, will it be available for Tabletop Simulator? It, it that comes up all the time. I don't know if you guys yeah. have seen it. it is oh no, 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 I'm sorry. Will it be efficient? Yes, yeah. I do know that. The print and play, um, yeah. I, I I have specifically made no comment on that subject. Oh, sorry. Uh, in <laughs> case anybody anybody feels like they need a official imprimatur from us as whatever, right? Like right, fine. Yeah. Uh, but um, no, I mean this stuff is going to happen. This is a modern game. Mm -hmm. I expect it to be played uh, in in all of the electronic methods, um, and and you know I think it's going to be good. But but um, we uh, we have a game that plays really well around the table, mm -hmm. and uh, and so far so far people have really enjoyed the face to face interaction with us at conventions, and we'll be really happy to. To bring it out when it's a real breathing game. So what's uh, the next stage after the Kickstarter ends in about a week? Where, well, where do you guys go from there? Well, I mean, we thought... <laughs> so Rodney thought... This is the Whoa, uh -oh. hey now. Whoa. Rodney thought, Let's be careful here. What's Rodney happening? Thought, like, uh, Rodney had a, a, a goal, right? He said he came in, the goals were really well established, right? Uh -huh. And he said, I need to make the componentry, essentially, right, for this sketched out version of the game which is essentially what we brought to kickstarter mm -hmm. and uh he finished that okay. um not long ago right like really not long ago yeah uh, right about the time i dreamed up a brand new expansion for the game <laughs> and said, said so guys <laughs> what if we took so there, there's sort of a principle in the the games there's a um, we call it a color wheel, um, which is uh, there's a set of skills in the game that power all the characters, and each has a major and minor skill. And uh, we were, I just said, what happens? What happens if we um, come up with the alternate universe versions of those? And so we came up with this corrupted set of characters. Mm -hmm. um, including most most uh, notably headlined by a character called the Briarlock, right. whose job is to be happy when other people are hurt. <laughs> Which is not something you want at your dinner party. 
right? Probably not. You know? <laughs> so, but this guy is is um, is actually the first character I played in Microholics Game of Thorn Watch, and I broke it completely. <laughs> I took all of the, like he thought, oh yeah, people are gonna play this way, and I I just sort of made sure that everybody was hurt all the time and uh, near near dead all the time. <laughs> and he's like, well, this is fun. I'm like, yeah, it's great for me. So. Uh, but um, we have a so we decided to make all these corrupted characters, which we haven't built out, and um, stories to go with them. And so now Rodney um, is going to help us do that because <laughs> you know I, I just sort of snuck that in. <laughs> yeah, uh, no big deal, uh, right? <laughs> nah, that's cool. So, yeah, we uh, we decided that our reaction. So you said, what is the what does having a big Kickstarter do for you? And, and the answer is, it makes you suddenly realize you have more opportunities than you thought you did. And so one mm -hmm. of the things we said was, these Kickstarter backers are backing us for a solid year. What happens? What what should we do to be nice to them for that? And the answer is, we decided to give them this expansion. Um, we we uh, it creates one extra massive cost for us, which is there's uh, it doubles the size of the box, or maybe even creates a different box that it gets shipped in. Right. So we were like, guys, if you want it, kick us an extra five bucks uh, for that, for literally for so that we can walk it to the post office. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Walk that money over and yeah. say, uh, "Please, please take this from us." Yeah. And um, people have responded really well to that. Um, mm -hmm. I, the the um, concept that people, will, if they back the Kickstarter, will get something before anybody else and for almost nothing yeah. um, has gone over, as you might expect, pretty right. well. <laughs> yeah. So that's the next thing. Um, I, I I have ideas for that expansion but i know that as soon as i get in a room with rodney and <laughs> get Jim, chad uh and maybe other designers from my team yeah. the um, the ideas will flow yeah yeah and who knows where we'll end up uh that's why we haven't done a this is what's going to be in the box yeah for that expansion because i'd much rather find out like the right way rather than say can somebody come up with you know, a thing for this yeah. right now, so I can tell the Kickstarter backers. Yeah. Um, but I'm excited yeah. about that. I'm excited Thanks. to work on a game with longevity, and that means yeah. that my friend Bunny can stick around for a while. Yeah. Yeah, and so. we when we were doing the initial design work or the initial development work, whatever you want to call it, one of the things that um, I had to draw on from my experience was that you could build these base systems in a way that would be expandable and then would still like click back together with everything that was in the like the base system once it was expanded um and, and so like it was really easy to sit down and look at like okay well we're building characters that have decks of cards let's design them with common elements so that when we get to the point where we want to design more of them they follow a certain design philosophy that we can then look back to and then like sometime in the future maybe we'll talk about like oh can you build your own characters and right. you know can they evolve can you take cards from other characters etc and so like if if we have a solid enough base system, we can do that. And so that was really important to me. So that now when Mike says, like, oh, yeah, by the way, we're going to design a whole bunch more characters, I can say, <laughs> okay, we can, we can do that, right? We have that technology. Right. Yeah. And I'm excited because this is a game that is not limited to uh, its own space. We started with the principle, um, we want to do three games, each of right. which is expandable. Yeah. We, uh, the, the reason is that... Uh, Mike and Jerry envision this world that, that is um, this magical forest uh, that that is um, sort of attacked by this horrible concept called the ebb, this, this miasma, and um, the uh, the the defenders of the forest are not just one group of people, right? So the Thorn Watch are the ghostly spirits that come out and when they're summoned through a bramble knot being tied in a tree. That's pretty awesome, right? And they come in and they're badass and they destroy everything. Um, the They are not the only force. And so there's this group called the Lookouts, which is basically Boy Scouts earning monster merit badges. Right. And they're going to get a really different game. They're, but... Uh, and, and then there's this other group called the Daughters, and they're these sort of mini-goddess, druidess, animal 
nature spirit you're not spirits but they're um <laughs> how do you describe it? they're 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 sort of protectors right, right. They're, and jerry describes them as alpha predators mm -hmm. or apex predators in the, the um but um and so they'll have a very different thing too they'll do something like like castle building and and so forth but the the really important element was all the characters need to be able to work in all the games okay so they're so, going to be compatible with each other in some way yeah, so so you can take a Thorn Watch over when a daughter has sent a mission, got a mm -hmm. mission to do, and it's a very different kind of mission than you will find in Thorn Watch, which might just be a rescue mission or a um, uh, a, a uh, you know this might be the 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 grove is under attack, you know. Wouldn't it be great if a Thorn Watch came in to help us? Let's summon one, you know. Yeah. So that group, that group might be the same design team. It might be different design teams, but they're all sort of going for the same kind of goal of yeah. let's make this beautiful comic book game that all sort of interacts with itself. And yeah. I think it's going to be really cool. Yeah, it's cool to explore this amazing world that uh, Mike and Jerry have built and uh, flesh it out over three games. And uh, I mean, do you guys plan on doing something like doing a role-playing book for it at some point? I mean, you guys have both worked for Wizards, so I mean, I can't imagine you haven't thought about putting out some sort of core rule book or something. For you know who You know who really wants to do that? Um, Jerry Hulk. Yeah, that's yeah. what I would figure, Jerry. Like, you know why he really wants to do it? Because he's never written a role-playing book. Yeah, that's a travesty. It needs to be <laughs> right? So Rodney and I are looking at this like, cool, we make something with a, you know, 16-page rule book. That sounds really good. <laughs> mm, yeah. Right? yeah. And Jerry is like, I want the entire world. Yeah. And so, so. I mean, you know, the, the thing is, when I first came on the project, um, it uh, it basically w was more role-playing game than board game in many respects, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it was, right. it was a tabletop RPG, but the problem was all of the design that, that Mike had done was really design for board game play and everything that would go on behind the scenes was all in Mike's head and basically I looked at it and I was like okay we, we can go two ways we can go uh, we can push hard towards a uh, board game or push towards a role playing game push towards role playing game means we need to figure out everything that you're just doing on instinct and like making up along the way how do we put that into a book that you can actually uh you know basically use to produce your own adventures and and that's a daunting task and that's why a lot of role-playing games end up with these 120 240 360 page yeah. books is because it takes a lot to explain the concept of being a dungeon master or a game master or a judge <laughs> especially when you've got a very specialized and very different uh, resolution system in the, f the form of like the cards and everything. So not only would we be teaching you how to be a dungeon master effectively, right. we'd also be teaching you how to be a game designer because there's a lot that goes on on that side that's like, okay, like these players have these car uh, card combos. How do I challenge them, you know, in the game? And so mm -hmm. like that was really daunting. And when we pushed more towards the board game, it was like, okay, like this is this is codifying things a little bit to take a lot of that burden off of the judge uh, that they would have to sort of learn how to deal with balance issues. Um, I actually just into uh, I guess my update went up yeah. today. Went up yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mm -hmm. talked a little bit about the evolution of the judge role and just sort of you know touched the surface of some of the changes we made and and why we made. Them, but it, a lot of it was just to basically be able to get some of the the mic creative magic into the game without also having to basically uh, produce a book that is like here's how you have here's what you have to do to be a game master a uh, Game designer and Mike Rahulik. Right. Yeah. All and also, right. here's how you draw. Yeah. Exactly. Right. <laughs> here's how you draw. So, uh, yeah, I mean, we have some experience with this in some ways, right? We, um, uh, Apocrypha is, as far as I know, the first game that is both uh, capable of being run as a uh, play against the game and um, as a full on role playing game. So, and that has been a blast to design. Uh, it's incredibly hard. And so um, we know that people are going to want to express themselves more than the method that we are giving them in the Ironwood in this game. And that is just a fact. Like it's going to be, people are going to immerse themselves in this world. And so it would be idiotic to uh, foreclose any possibilities at this point. Um, I think the uh, the way we're looking at it now is we've laid out a plan for what is probably at least six products, 
and that's going to take a lot of time and a lot of effort. And so, but uh, I know that the the guys are so excited. The guys at Penny Arcade are so excited about the progress we're making that they're uh, dipping in the waters of of other expressions of it that are that are cool. So, for example, some of the monsters show up in the game Duelist, right? Right. Yeah. Um, and so, the more we get sort of exposure to that, and 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 get real confident with the games we're making, the more we'll probably poke at the edges and look at look outside and so forth. And it would not shock me if at some point there's what would be called more traditional role-playing game content. Yeah, yeah. I think you guys, uh, when you decided to go with a board game instead of a role-playing game, I, I think one of... It might have been you, Mike, or Mike Rahulik, that talked about how if we were just doing a role-playing game... It was so. It would be so similar to D and D that why are we trying to do D and D when D and D is like the best version of that currently? Like why not try to do something different? Rodney and I are pretty big fans of Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, I, yeah, I, 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 I have some stake in it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, and and so whether wh- whatever you call that, by the way, whatever you call that, whether you call that Pathfinder or whether you call that, right. you know, some other like Call of Cthulhu, any mm-hmm. number of other methods of traditional role-playing games that it just didn't feel like we needed to do that right i mean we we had an opportunity to do something else and while a fully fully illustrated standard rpg book with 300 pages in it probably would have been cool we didn't wouldn't necessarily feel like we were brave oh we lose mike do we lose him else and oh, oh, I mean, <laughs> hardwired in some things that you just what happened uh, you froze you're fine I, I froze i'm back i'm back um uh, we hardwired in some things that um that just don't exist in any other game i mean we're giving you reasons to cosplay the game um we've got these knots that you get that you can wear Mm-hmm. and have gameplay effects. Um, we're giving you reasons to write poems and, and uh, you know, do, do other creative aspirations and stuff. And so um, we're, we're trying to build a lifestyle that I think people have already shown us they want to be in, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, I'm very excited for the watch. I'm running our first game for it on Tuesday, live on Twitch. Oh. So do you guys have any tips for me? On- Tuesday, you mean like during the time the campaign is running? That's right. That's right. Exactly. Oh, so, you need to send us send us information about that. We will tell yeah. people to tune in. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. It'll be Tuesday at 8 p.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time, and I, I already have four people uh, ready to play. And I'm trying to figure out a way if we can, because our stream is all about interaction, if we can have the audience donate like Ed tokens or extra monsters or give players extra cards to draw something so that we can interact with it, but do you guys have any tips for me as a first-time judge for this game? Uh, well, I mean, you know, the the game is a little bit different from, um, you know, a role-playing game. It's a little bit different from a lot of board games. Uh, the role of the judge is uh, adversarial, or sorry, it is, uh, you're an opponent. Right. Maybe not necessarily adversarial, but right. you're definitely an opponent, uh, and you're trying to make life difficult for the, the Thorn Watch. So, um, we give you the ebb resource to kind of, you know, limit you. I mean, like in, in a uh, role-playing game, right? You could ostensibly, if you really wanted to kill the players, you're like, and there's a red dragon behind every door. What are you going to do? Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's a blue dragon at the end of that tunnel. Don't go down there. <laughs> Mike. What? Uh, I did. Oh. It's not like, I want to be clear. I went down the tunnel because there was no other way out. <laughs> That's... That's one way to look at it. Anyways, so <laughs> it the, like, I looked at it when my character died. Yeah. Do you know uh, what I looked at? I looked at a lot of electricity. That's what did. I looked at. He did. Uh, <laughs> and so, anyways, yeah, the judge has you know the ebb resource there to uh, kind of you know let you know like okay, this is how much you can like hurt the players like this right. this amount right. So I would say uh, uh, a big key to to playing the judge is finding the right moments to use the ebb uh, in such a way that it like, you know, it it can be 
really exciting when you use Ebb uh, for like flipping a monster over to its Ebb and Fuse side right as the character is like really reeling or you know it like when when things are looking like they're going really well for the the players like a, a sufficient application of Ebb can really uh, cause the game to take a little bit of a turn. Okay. Um, you can also get um, it also works on the other side too. The players have um, hero dice that right. they yeah. uh, that they activate by using the traits that are on their cards. So you know if they're particularly playing in character and stuff like that, you can reward them. Well, you can abdicate that role for your broadcast. Yeah, you can yeah, say yeah. audience gets to decide whether those players right. are using their their uh, traits appropriately and mm-hmm. say, you know, Bob gets a hero dice. Yeah. You know. yeah. Uh, Sandy, she gets a she she gets that because she was particularly angry. Right. And you know, whatever. And so um, and so I think there's a lot of opportunity for the um, the creative decision making to be uh, Twitch plays Pokemon uh, right. here, right? <laughs> right. You know, to, yeah. to, and so uh, I think uh, I think there's a lot there. I'll be interested in seeing what happens when you do it, because I think it'll be pretty great. Yeah, I'm very yeah. excited, Ryan. Um, so that's all I have for uh, questions, guys. If you had anything else to say, if you want to pimp out your Kickstarter one last time, I'm sure you do. It's on Kickstarter. Okay. <laughs> what else is there to say than that, right? What else is there? Yeah, um, we'll obviously put a link down uh, in this. Uh, this will probably go up tomorrow, so it'll well be... Uh, you'll still have time about four or five days. It ends on Wednesday. Yeah. Am I correct about that? Yeah, it ends Wednesday at five p.m. Pacific. Um, we'll be doing some things in the last last few hours as well. So, oh, cool. um, yeah, we'll. Uh, uh, but yes, uh, there will be all sorts of uh, activity on this. It's it's good, been really good to to contact folks directly through the Kickstarter again, and I, I think that they'll they'll like it if they come over and take a look at what we're doing. Yeah, cool. Well, awesome. Well, thank you, guys. Thank you for talking with me, and uh, best of luck with Thornwatch. I can't wait to play the final version. Thank Thanks, you, man. man. I look forward to your uh, your game on Tuesday. Awesome. Yeah. All right, guys. Have a good one. You too. So that was the interview. Thanks for watching, and be sure to tune into our live playthrough of Thornwatch on October 4th at 8 p.m. Pacific on our Twitch channel, which is twitch.tv slash show. And if it's already past that date, I'm sure you can find a link for it down below. Um, that's all. See you guys next time.